We move on to our last panel of the day. It's called Scaling to Success. And this panel is all about building your brand. And if you're someone who has a business, rubbing off that magic into scaling your own business. This panel doesn't even need an introduction, but we do have one. Let's take a look at this video. Joining moderator Alexander Liebner now are Khat Johan Kutsir, fashion designer. Fashion is ingrained in Khat Johan Kutsir's DNA. His high glamour showstopper gowns are increasingly seen on red carpets around the world and on global superstars, including Oprah Winfrey, Lauren Hill, Kelly Rowland, and Fantasia Barino. Sandra Mwihangele, cosmetic chemist and CEO at Kiyomi Sands Beauty Products. Sandra founded Kiyomi Sands in 2015 after studying analytical chemistry and gaining experience in Cape Town. She was the first Namibian to be listed on Forbes Africa 30 Under 30 Class of 2017. Sylvester Chalke, Chief Architect at DNA Brand Architects. CNBC Africa's All Africa Young Business Leader of the Year 2017. Sylvester Chalke is a multi-award winning entrepreneur and founder of DNA Brand Architects. Trevor Sturman, multimedia visual artist. Born in Kimberley, 26-year-old Trevor graduated with a BA Honors in Motion Picture and Live Performance from AFTA. He sees the world through his creative lens and finds beauty in that which reminds him of home. Alexander Kniefs, founder of Printulu. Alexander comes from a family of entrepreneurs. When starting Printulu, an investor promised him $1 million in funding. But the conditions of the contract were so unfavorable, he couldn't sign the contract. Well, good afternoon, everyone in the room, and uh, a very special welcome to all of those uh, watching on CNBC Africa. Thank you for stepping into the Forbes Africa Under 30 Meetup. This is not your usual afternoon watching on CNBC Africa, but I think you're going to walk away with quite a bit. Lots of, uh, well, lots to talk about, very little time. And uh, as you would have picked up, we've got one hell of a rock star lineup here to talk about scaling for success talking about how do you build a brand and then how do you scale a business and then how do you do that if you've got both. So I'm gonna kick this wide open because we have quite a bit to get through. And uh, Sylvester, I think you're the, the one branding man on the, on, mm. on the panel, professionally, mm. uh, DNA Brand Architects. Sylvester, what, why is it so important to have a brand? Um, you know, and what, what makes that brand so strong? I think over time we have seen that um, businesses and products alone are not enough to be able to drive big scale across consumers. So a brand actually is very helpful to ensure that your products are much bigger than what they really are. So in order for consumers to be able to connect with your business or your product, they kind of need to know what the brand is and of course build a connection you know, with that. Over and above that, we've seen that in the last decade, most valuations of big businesses, whether it's Apple or whether it's Barlow World or Telcom, um, the size and the quality of the brand is becoming much more important you know, in, the, in the actual cost um, and size of the business. So the brand aspects of it are, are worth much more. So example, if you said Apple, the brand is worth so much more than just the assets or the business that it actually is. Um, and so when you're building a brand into the future or a business into the future, you want to make sure that it is a brand. I mean, someone who's, who's directly making uh, money off brand is Gerd. It's, it's you. I mean, people buy your garments because it's a, it's a Gerd Johan Kutzier uh, garment. Thank right? you. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I think people buy the garments um, because we have built a lot of brand equity and trust. I think over the years we've been consistent um, every year trying to up ourselves, thinking um, what the client would want next. Um, and then the big lesson there is for me is the, the more clients you get and the more clients come back, the bigger their expectation of the brand. So you constantly have to up one. 
um, every season, every garment. Um, if it's a custom-made suit, the next suit has to be better. If it's a, a T-shirt that says hat, next year it has to say, say hat with sparklers. So you <laughs> constantly have to um, reinvent yourself and, yeah. and up what you're offering to the people. But um, I think it is a great way, um, like Sylvester said, with a brand like Apple and Coca-Cola, you kind of already, in your mind, know what it's about. Um, and whatever products they then have in it is then always different. And, and I think just to have that big umbrella um, of equity that you can always fall back on is, is something to work towards and building that brand takes a, a, lot, a lot of time and a lot of dedication, but it's so worth it in the end. But, but it's quite tricky and I think this is maybe where we, we get into the meat of it as well, is that you know, the brand is capped. Now how do you, how do you scale that? Because you know, you're the magic. I mean, you can't have somebody come and buy a dress from you and say, well, look, here's Martin. Martin's yeah. going to look after you. Um, <laughs> they're coming to see you. So yeah. how do you now take that to? Because, Karen, you were telling me earlier on you've, you've got about a team of 30 people working. Yes, yes. So, so we currently employ 30 people that makes the um, Fashion Week um, production and also the wedding gowns and the red carpet things that you always see um, everybody walking in. It. Um, um, but I think the big thing there is also just deciding where you want to place yourself and, and finding a way to create passive income. Um, that's why we've created the online store that has lots of merchandise that you can buy on there. So it's anything from cocktail dresses to literally t-shirts that says hat. Um, that is kind of what we do to scale the business. And then from the custom-made side where people see me, then of course we have up those prices where it's really just for the cream of the crop and the people that want the custom experience with me and the rest of the people that also want a bit of hat but um, can't really afford the, 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 the gown, um, then goes to the online store or to a physical store in London and then they can buy it there. Or Luminance. So that is kind of how we've done it by creating a diffusion brand that is available in boutiques and online. And Trevor, I mean, you, you must be in a, in a very similar kind of game. I mean, uh, you're, once again, the, you know, you're the face behind the brand. How do you take what you do and make it bigger? Um, so my work is basically about storytelling. And I guess just because of my story coming, growing up in Kimberley, a place that is always discounted and disregarded when you think about creativity, my story always amplifies with every milestone I reach and every victory, and I think it just naturally and organically grows. And I think people always gravitate to a story and that I think is a core of each and every brand because when you think of products, everyone can sell a product. And in my instance, I sell images and I sell stories. So I think my story is then amplified by, I guess, my journey. And I think that's quite, quite special. I mean, Gats just touched on, uh, you know, something maybe that's pretty natural to, to this audience. I know for, for some of us who've been around for a bit longer, the idea of how technology has changed your business. Mm. Uh, we were talking about Instagram shopping early on, which is uh, sort of emerging now. I mean, Trevor, that must also be playing a, a big part in your space. I mean, 30 years ago, you were, you know, taking <laughs> pictures. You'd have to sell them to some big agency. Now you just go online, you can yeah. sell pictures in your sleep, basically, and make money in your sleep. Um, technology is very instrumental, and especially within the space that I, I, I kind of play in. Um, my first camera was a cell phone, and I always believe that it is important to always work with what you have and use whatever resources that you have to kind of upscale yourself. So um, I never looked at having like the biggest camera, but it was always about like a story that could move someone and a picture that personally touched me and for me it is those kind of moments that kind of built my my brand and in terms of just technology how I kind of um, maximized my my social media presence and used I started off on Facebook um, my friends and I back in Kimberley were in high school and our biggest platform at the time was mix it and Facebook and we used to do all these editorials that we then share on these platforms and fast track to now um, we are all doing well in our respective fields within, I guess, fashion and, and, um, and art. Well, let's bring in uh, Sandra and, and Alex into this conversation. Uh, former under 30 uh, alumni uh, on the list before. And, uh, you know, you, you're in, in, in very different spaces to, you know, uh, Gert and, and, and Sylvester and, and, and Trevor. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more uh, manufacturing. It's more sort of behind-the-scenes stuff. You're not really uh, out 
uh, in, 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 uh, on red carpets uh, having photos <laughs> taken of you. Uh, uh, how have you found your uh, journey of, of trying to now grow a business that was your idea, but now you're starting to have to hand over the reins to other people? Maybe, Sandra, let's, let's kick off with you. I think for me, I heavily rely on the products that I produce. So I allow my products to sell my image and my brand because when people see the excellence in my product, they want to know who created it. And that's how I actually um, became known in my country. And I knew at the time when I started out, um, no one knew who I was, and I wanted to get people's attention. So I made sure that the very first product that I created, which was in my mom's garage at the time, I had uh, saved up 20,000 um, rands. And I used all of that to heavily invest into the branding of this product because I needed to create a product that would, cre um, that would um, create attention and, and uh, get people's interest in what I'm doing. So I definitely rely on my skills and what I produce to attract that, um, how should I say? <laughs> Get that business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, Alex, I'm going to bring you in just now, but Sylvester, just to, to Sandra's point. Mm. I mean, it's, it, it's, it seems to be a key part of building a successful business that you actually also have to be the face of that business. Mm. Uh, it can't be everything, but it has to certainly play a part. I think there are parts and businesses that where Wade helps. It helps to know who the people behind the brand or the business are. But I think maybe what's important now is to just clarify the scaling of the business and of course, the scaling of the brand are two very different things. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when we talk about um, scaling of our business in our own experience is that, you know, it, it is something that pushed us and uh, led us into spaces where we had to really extend ourselves much more than we've ever done that before. Example, starting from a 50 square meter um, office into like a, a thousand, one and a half thousand square meters, how you manage that is different, you know? Um, staff members, how you manage a, a small team of 10 to a team of 100 is one thing. Um, and I remember, you know, Cedric Dupoco, who's our business operations, he's actually in the audience. Um, from the business operations side, how do we ensure that we've got the, 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 the ability to deliver on that scale in that business, you know, whether it is payroll, whether it is policies and processes to, in the business, and also once you get to a particular size, you have to be able to operate with, with certain levels of governance that are required, paperwork that is required, so it actually really stretches your business into a completely different space. It's not just about we've got the product, we must now put it out, it's also about do we have the infrastructure and the ability to be able to scale the business. For us, it has been the most difficult part, is how do we move from 50 people to like 150 people, you know? And that transition, it really requires a lot of grit. Um, and so part of the brand is not just DNA brand architects, what we are about, what we are known in the market, but it's also about how are we able to continue to sustain and deliver a business in that way. And we're still in that process and we are learning. And every day we get burnt um, and we, we struggle a lot with some of these really, really difficult elements. Um, you know, at one point we had 20 policies written in the office to ensure that there's governance across all the different areas because it is required by law to be able to do that. So um, the scaling of a business has to be divided into two. Look at the brand, look at the business, and the elements of the brand that can be done, those are easy to do because the branding aspects are simple, but the actual operational efficacy of a business requires a lot more than just branding. Well, Sylvester, getting into the mechanics there, and I mean, uh, uh, Alex, your, your business is very much about automation. It's, it's almost a, a scaling on a, on a slightly different, uh, different uh, note. Uh, how did you tackle your growth challenges? In Printulu. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a very good point. So I, I actually want to add on, on, on what Sylvester said. Um, in the beginning, it's very easy, I would say, to deliver on a brand or mm. to actually deliver on a brand promise. But once you're scaling, it becomes much harder because you're not directly involved in every day-to-day -day interface of the brand. Um, so it's kind of always, is, is, is you're building a brand, you're scaling, um, and then they kind of, if the brand grows too quickly, it damages the brand almost because you can't keep up to your brand promise. So it's always that balance that you need to find um, between operational excellence, uh, a, a, as you were describing, and uh, living up to your brand promise. Um, why I think, um, and, and how this becomes easier, I think, and this is what you were also talking about in why brand is so much 
uh, more valued uh, today with Apple, um, for example, with Amazon, is the purpose behind those companies. Mm -hmm. And once you have that purpose behind the companies, investors buy into losses, customers buy your company, uh, buy your product, even though it's more expensive. Um, um, your employees uh, work harder because um, they believe in what you're doing. Uh, for example, with Google making all information accessible. And, and everything becomes easier the moment the brand is aligned, I would say, with all the stakeholders. Um, and, and once this is achieved, then I wouldn't say financials are not that important, but I'm coming here obviously from a different perspective. Um, I would just say they fall into place. Um, your retention rates go up, your customer acquisition costs go down, um, your re revenue um, keeps growing, and these are partly effects of a effective brand campaign. True, and I'm also add, add as well is that a part of that, what is really difficult as well as you, as you grow, because I know that for me, we've been in business for seven years, and in the seven years that we've been in business, it is tougher now than it was before, mm -hmm. because to sustain and to keep the size of the business going and growing at such a rate like it was in the past is a lot more difficult. So you are struggling to make sure that you are looking at your input costs and your margin around it. So how do we ensure that we can make better margins? In the past, we could make better margins because it was much more smaller. Now, to make the same margins we used to make three years ago is costing us a lot of money to do so, and it's actually a lot more challenging. So not only do we have to look at just the input costs, but we also have to look at um, you know, the, eff the efficiencies of running your business because as it grows bigger, you could also waste a lot of money in between. So you have to be a lot more <laughs> tough, I guess, in terms of being able to do that. So I think for the panel or for everyone that's sitting around, the big thing is around the balance of the brand, the balance of the business. And it's easy to build the brand. It's just that much more tricky to ensure that your business, your setup, your infrastructure is also set and in geared in that way as well. I see you're nodding your head quite, quite yeah, that uh, in was, agreement there with, with it's Sylvester. It's so amazing how we all have the same problems. And you're sitting here maybe thinking now, oh, that doesn't apply to me yet. But then when you grow, the, the faster you grow, the more fires you have to put out. And we actually at a point had to put out fires so constantly that we um, joined a business incubator. Uh, it was called Auric, um, Best decision we ever made. We were with them for two years. And they really help us set the business up, much bigger than it was at that point. And their constant question was, what has to, what has to happen for a system to fail? What, what, what big order or pressure you have to have for the wheels to fall off? Mm -hmm. And um, we actually put great systems in place. Before then, I didn't even know what a system or, or a procedure was. <laughs> and now that is kind of the backbone of the business. So advice for, for new entrepreneurs, make sure from the beginning of your business that you set those systems up properly to handle the pressure as you grow. Because as you're growing, you can't also now be putting out fires at the same time. It doesn't work. And then you damage the brand in the end of the day because you're disappointing customers. But isn't that, isn't that also a, a bit of a, a, a I suppose, a, a maybe an amplified issue with creatives? Mm. Um, I mean, I suppose when, when kids go to their parents and say, I want to be a singer, I want to be an actor, uh, a photographer, a fashion designer, whatever, they go, oh, no, like, you know, what happened to the doctor or the lawyer or the accountant? <laughs> you know, let's get, a, let's get a proper degree. And then, like, you know, if that doesn't work out, you know, you've always got something to fall back on. Uh, I mean, Trevor, how do you, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, kind of marry business, but also keep the art, you know, clean and pure as, as you've wanted to do it? <laughs> It's quite, a, it's quite a difficult one, but like, I think the two are mutually exclusive. But I think being a creative, you need to become, you are naturally a problem solver. So, mm -hmm. but in order to kind of, you kind of also have to pick a, a side. It, like, if I'm gonna be a creative, like I'm gonna become a professional, it's either I'm gonna become a full-time creative, or I'm gonna become a professional creative and have a back end. And a back end means having management, having accountant, having all those systems in place and ensuring that it's still a, a, a profitable business, but then the kind of creative output is still in place. So you kind of have to have a team and initially you have to be the team. So, and I, I think that's also part of upscaling. It's just like growing and understanding that being a creative is a business and you need to kind of separate yourself from the art and the commerce. 
you can't just do it because it's fun. You also have to send someone an invoice eventually. Absolutely. Yeah, and the for sure. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, uh, we, we run out of time. Uh, it's unbelievable how time flies when you're, when you're talking brand. But uh, thank you so much. I mean, I think this, I mean, there's no better panel to, to represent, uh, you know, making money and really positioning yourself in the creative space in this panel. So let's just give them a big round of applause. And thank you so much for making yourself available. And uh, at this point, I'm going to say cheers to everyone watching on CNBC Africa. Thank you for joining us at the Forbes Africa Under 30 Meetup for 2019. I hope you've taken something away. I hope you've uh, been inspired to uh, maybe take on uh, a, a hobby that you might want to scale into something bigger, or maybe it's your own brand and your own business that you think might need a bit of a refresh. Whatever it is, thank you for stepping into the Under 30 space. And uh, back to uh, the guys in Johannesburg at the studio.